Good afternoon again. Um, so this is their second lecture, talking about, not counting the introduction, but uh, talking about port systems. <laughs> Excuse me. So when we are here on Canvas, this is that chapter two PowerPoint. It's just really the second PowerPoint of content. This is a link to the lectures at the top. Those are our lectures for um, for the YouTube channel. Obviously you found them, but uh, that will have everything you need for the semester and you're able to review at that point. I think it even can generate a trans, uh, yeah, transcript if you'd like. Um, at this point, you've done all of this part. Um, you've watched the introduction video. You've gone through constitutional frameworks and watched the video. And now you're looking at the different cases and how to organize your notes. If you can complete the First Amendment handout, right? If you can look at those cases and you understand, then you're doing wonderfully. You're right where you need to be. So let's then look at the court structure because I've talked a lot about whether the court, noise freezes, whether the 14th Amendment um, applies or doesn't apply to a case. Um, and so whether it's federal or state, we've, we've kind of gone through that a little bit, but let's talk a little bit about what that means for us. Before we start, um, a quick recap. The Sixth Amendment guarantees a speedy trial. Uh, red flags begin to raise after um, one year. After one year. Closer to six months, but about one year. Bail is reasonably calculated in light of perceived evil. It has to be cruel and unusual. So is it humiliating? Is it degrading? Um, and then um, it can't be arbitrary, and then it must be completely rejected by society. That's the only way any punishment can be considered cruel and unusual. <clears throat> now, let's look at courts. So here we go, court structures. First thing we have to know is when it comes to courts, we have to know the jurisdiction. That phrase is used often, and that just means their power to actually hear a case in that area, right? Where can, what kinds of cases can they hear? What, um, and what types of cases are they allowed, are they allowed to hear? So for example, um, we've talked a little bit about the appeals courts, right? And the Supreme Court, they can't hear, uh, they, they can't be the court of original jurisdiction. They have to be, the, or the trial court, right? They have to be um, post-conviction. So they're an appeals court, so they have a limited jurisdiction as far as that goes. First thing we're gonna ask ourselves though, if we're gonna determine the type of case regarding jurisdiction, what is this court's jurisdiction? I wanna know, is the court, I'm sorry, is the case criminal or civil? Is it a criminal case or is it a civil case? There's different statutes and different legislation that's going to apply to both of those scenarios. So while we talk about double jeopardy, et cetera, it is true that you can't hear a case in juvenile court and adult court, right? The same case. You can't hear uh, the same adult court case twice. Um, but if you go from criminal to civil, that's a different that's a different regulation and there's a different standard of proof. Same as if it's state federal, where there's different legislation. So those are definitely two different cases. So in, in those cases, that will not qualify as double jeopardy. So the first thing we're going to ask ourselves, if I say, man, who's going to hear this case? I want to know who's going to hear this case. The big issue last semester was, um, or two semesters ago, I believe, there was the student that uh, was charged with a decency with a child from UNCW. And they're like, who's going to hear the case? Who's going to hear the case? And it's like, well, first, is it criminal or is it civil? And it was criminal, right? Is it a state crime or is it a federal crime? If it's a state crime, meaning that it's a violation of North Carolina law that is not um, incorporated to all the states yet, so not made federal, you haven't crossed state bounds or it's not a law that's been incorporated, um, then it will stay at the state level. Most cases will stay at the state level. And then we're going to say, where did the crime happen? Not where is the defendant now, where did the crime, alleged crime, I guess, happen? If you steal a car in Texas and you drive it to, well, let's not say, I don't know, and it's traced to New Mexico, right? We, we don't want to say you cross bounds because it may become federal. Um, it's going to be brought, the case will be brought in Texas. Where did the crime event occur? Now, jurisdiction has to do, is it criminal, is it civil, is it state or is it federal? And then where is the actual location? And this location is really specific to venue. So this is the geographical area. It's usually county. I don't always say county um, because there are states like uh, um, Louisiana. They have parishes because they're under Napoleonic law. But we look at this and we'll say what area um, is allowed to hear the case. So 
Um, when we talk about jurisdiction, it's going to be what what type of court, civil, criminal, federal, state, and then in what state. But when we start to look at venue, we're going very focused and we're going to say what county. Now, we have 100 counties here in North Carolina, so we have um, at least 100 venues. And it's usually going to be based on where the crime takes place. There are some exceptions that we'll talk about soon. Um, usually that's related to uh, hardship uh, uh, for either the offender or um, witnesses or something. Okay. Here I have written 41. That is incorrect. I made this a long time ago. And I keep forgetting to change it. Um, we have 100 venue options. North Carolina has 100 counties. We have 100 venue options. That is not an accurate number. That is not the right number. That is not the right number. So as long as you are watching the videos, you'll get that on the test because that is a question. And so here's all of our court districts. These are, this is the uh, venue for each type of, uh, for the offense, depending on where it occurred, right? If we have a state crime, we're gonna go with the local level and we're going to go for that, that venue um, within that county. So here's what I'm trying to say to you, right? So Bill Murray, he lives and he works in California. He kills a jaywalker while he's going through Wilmington, North Carolina. Which state court has jurisdiction over the case? It's where the crime event happened. It's not related to the offender in most cases. So we would say North Carolina state court has jurisdiction. And so then what county will that be held in? What venue would we use for this case? It would be New Hanover County, right? The jurisdiction is North Carolina and the venue is gonna be New Hanover County. So there are two questions again, when we look at jurisdiction and then we're going to say in the venue, we're looking at the actual county level usually. Now here's where we're looking at our connection to the constitution, right? How is this decided? Why did we choose this structure? Well, we outlined it in the sixth amendment. It says you have a speedy and public trial, remember? Time, but it's an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime has been committed, shall have been committed, right? So it's about the crime event, not the offender. And that's outlined in the constitution. So if we are incorrect, like if we, if we, if we make a mistake or, or whatever, we go through and we do this a different way, um, we go against this venue outline and somebody is convicted, they might be able to appeal under the Sixth Amendment. Now, we do allow change of venues. We do allow change of venue, but there has to be a couple of reasons. There's only a couple of justifications, right? So if you're going to request, and it's only a request, a change of venue, number one, you have to either prove that there's such a prejudice in that county that you cannot get a fair or impartial trial, or the second is that there's a much more convenient location, right? So let me go back one. Okay, so here, we say that, um, well, we'll do number one in a second. Let's look at the second first in a minute. Let's look at the second first. Callie, who I steal all my stuff from for this class that, that we are colleagues and she takes all my correction stuff. We are, um, she was a lawyer in Louisiana and they had somebody that was consistently uh, showing up late to court. And they're like, what is going on? It's like, I'm sorry, you know, I have to get um, my boat to get over to the ferry to get the ferry to go to the street to get that, you know, and he was like crossing, like, and it was insane. The way that he was trying to get to court to show up for these trials, for his trial, <clears throat> required that he like boat himself and then get to a um, different transportation. And, and so frequently he would miss one type of public transportation for another um, because of another. And so they said, we can just do it in your county. You know, that was not a problem. In that case, it was such a hardship it was such a hardship for this uh, defendant to show up for court, never said a word to till that point, but uh, to show up for the actual trial, that it was no problem to have the change of venue. It was granted. It was granted and nobody had a, a major objection to it. Then there are cases of prejudice, right? So we see this prejudice case. This is typically going to be brought up in scenarios that um, are uh, publicly covered crimes, for example, James, James Holmes, I'll let you watch this on your own time, but he's the man who believed he was the Joker and he went into the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado and um, just 
open fire, right? So he did kill a lot of people. But what his uh, lawyer said, right? So state of Colorado was going to have, it wants to do with federal, right? But state of Colorado is going to have jurisdiction. State of Colorado had jurisdiction. And then Arapahoe County was the venue. Well, his lawyer argued, he said, there is no way. Everybody in Arapahoe County either knows somebody that was in the theater and killed or knows somebody who knows somebody. There's no way he's going to get a fair trial. The media coverage was too intense and the connections are too strong. What did the judge decide? Is there such prejudice that you cannot get a fair or impartial trial? The judge said the media coverage was everywhere. So if we're going on media coverage, it's everywhere. Everybody got the same information in this day and age. And so it's not going to be that you're going to get a more fair trial in an area that had less media coverage because the media coverage was national and immediate. It was a big deal. So they did keep it in Arapahoe County. You can watch that on your own time. So when we talk about jurisdiction, our very first question is, is civil or criminal? We are following the criminal path. We're only following criminal cases in this uh, course. It's criminal procedure. Um, so the second question and the first that's relevant to us is the offense going um, a violation of state or federal law um, and in which in which court system does it want to be tried? There are similarities in the structure. They're both hierarchical. hierarchical. Um, we have this court of original jurisdiction, which is where we first hear the facts of the case. Tiffany killed Joe at 2.30 on Tuesday. This is where we decide if that's true, right? Did Tiffany kill Joe? Was it at 2.30? Is the evidence appropriate for that? Was it collected appropriately? Is it hearsay evidence? Where are we getting this information? Was it on Tuesday? Was it Joe? Was it self-defense? Is she, uh, um, you know, considered legally insane, right? So we look at these scenarios and all of that's happening in the original, the court of original jurisdiction, the trial court. After that is decided, if there is a conviction, I gotta move my face again, I'm doing this again. Um, if there is a conviction, um, then what can happen is the if there was a violation of um, due process or any sort of constitutional protection, then there can be an appeal. You can appeal the case, and that's an appellate court. So we all have a trial court. We all have an appellate court, whether you're state or federal charges. Then we usually will go to a Supreme Court, and this is where, and if you disagree with the appellate court, right, they uphold the case and then they, you disagree, you can pursue a Supreme Court um, review. They'll decide if they choose to take that case, but they're going to look at the law itself and compare that law to the Constitution, whether it's state or federal Constitution. The Supreme Court is going to be that that has the final say so. Whatever the Supreme Court says goes, except in cases where the state will appeal to the federal Supreme Court. But our Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, is the absolute. Yeah, remember judicial review and uh, supremacy, the supremacy clause. There is no argument after that point. Um, that's only half true, right? You can argue that uh, the original um, decision, for example, Roe v. Wade, they did that. The original decision is um, out of the context of the Constitution, but they would have to choose to hear that case. So the courts are the decision making authority. Remember, the judge is going to make all legal decisions looking at the procedure, but it's the jury that's going to make the factual decisions. The factual decision is that literally deciding, was it Tiffany? Was it Joe? Was it murder? Was it 2.30? Um, whatever it is. So um, then from that point, right, you can choose a bench trial. You have a choice between a jury trial and a bench trial in most cases. A jury trial is where you allow the jury to make the decisions on the on the facts of the case. Uh, a bench trial is where you let the judge make the decision. You waive your right to a jury and you put it all in the hands of the judge. You can ask for that as well. So here, um, oh, Tiffany, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, we're going to work our way down here, right, is the court of last resort. They only hear about one to 2% of the cases that are that are appealed to them and they get to choose what cases they hear. So when they made the decision on Roe v. Wade, it is because they chose to take that case on. If they don't want to make that decision yet or they're not ready for it, then they don't take that case. They don't, they don't 
grant a writ of satori for that case. Okay. So let's start at the very, that's the top and our very bottom, our venue is down here at the county level. Okay. Oh. So we have our 100 venue options. And this is, darn it, this is going to be for the state side. I'm going to skip this part. Okay. So in the state process, we have these 100 venue options. And those venues are available for trial court, the court of original jurisdiction. If you are convicted and disagree with the process, you can appeal to your state appellate court. The appellate court will review not, the appellate court does not review the facts of the case. They only look at the constitutionality of the process. If they uphold the case and you decide that it is still unconstitutional, you can appeal to the state Supreme Court. When you appeal to the state Supreme Court, right, um, the state Supreme Court, then uh, again, we're looking at selection. There are very few cases, but sometimes the uh, state Supreme Court, it, almost all cases are going to die at the, the appellate, the first level. Um, actually, most die at trial court, but um, most die before that. Mostly, please. Okay, sorry, plea bargains. But um, the, sometimes the Supreme Court will take a case from the state Supreme Court, U.S. SCOTUS is what we call them, right? Supreme Court of the United States. SCOTUS, they will take a case from the state Supreme Court, but that's pretty, uh, again, it's very unusual. So for the trial court, we have 100 venue options. In the federal process, we just kind of have one less appeal. And instead of having what we call trial courts, we have district courts. We have three districts in North Carolina. We literally have like Central, Eastern, Western. And those three districts each have a federal court house, at least one. So what we're saying at that point is that if you are charged with a federal crime in, I don't know, uh, Oklahoma, you don't have to go to D.C. to have your case heard. You don't have to go to the nation's capital to have your case heard because each state has district courts in place. And these are courts of original jurisdiction. So this is where we are seeing, again, that they are finding the facts of the case, defining the facts of the case. We have three here in North Carolina. We are obviously Eastern, <laughs> um, and, and we'll look at that in just a second. If you disagree with, if you're convicted and you disagree with the decision um, in district court, you can appeal to the circuit courts. We have 13 circuits in the country. We have 13 circuits in the country. You need to know which circuit North Carolina is in, because we're going to look at that when we start to look at um, application of laws. Now, from there, from there, from the Court of Appeals, again, you can um, appeal to the Supreme Court, but they select which cases they want to hear that term or that session. What I want to state to you, though, before we start, I kind of mouthed off on this a little bit, but we look at this district court, we look at this trial court. Before any of that, very few cases, like less than 10% of cases, actually ever even go to trial. Most are uh, handled with plea deals. Like 90 to 95% of cases are handled with plea deals. So what we're talking about here is for a very small portion of cases um, compared to the overall cases that actually come through the court system. So if we look at the federal case here, right, if we look at our court of original jurisdiction, that's going to be a district court. This is where we do the decision-making process. We all have at least one, right? And the judges are appointed for life. They do have advice and consent of the Senate, meaning they have to be Senate approved, but they're appointed for life because we don't want them to have like a dog in the fight. We don't want there to be any scenario where a judge feels like they are indebted to anybody. And if we do it by elections, then we do feel like there is some sort of a, a tit for tat scenario. And so we want to make sure they're appointed for life with the idea that that will eliminate um, some forms of corruption. So here are ours, ours, here are ours. Um, and those are the, literally the three stripes. It looks like Neapolitan ice cream, right? Um, and those are our three uh, court districts. Now, remember that district court is a court of original jurisdiction in the federal process. The court of original jurisdiction in the federal process. When we go for an appeal, then, from the district court, the court of original jurisdiction, then we would go to the appellate court. So this is all about discretionary review on where it goes. We have 13 circuits in the United States. You can see North Carolina here. You can see which circuit we are in. So if you appeal, we do have courthouses in our circuit. Again, you're still not having to go to DC necessarily. Um, you would go to the fourth circuit. Um, we have, we, and we have uh, appellate courts there. And these are going to be our um, 
uh, Court of Appeals through the circuit. Sorry, I was trying to get that said right. Um, it's really based, and you can see a little bit that it's, it seems to be based on population density um, a bit or, or concentration, um, with the exception of maybe California. So when we look at appellate court judges, it's the same thing. They're Senate approved, they're appointed for life, but they hear the cases in panels. And I think it's typically three judge, uh, just judges that are there to hear the case. And then they make a decision really just based on majority, agree or don't agree. But if it goes from the appellate court to the Supreme Court, which is like the ultimate appeals court, this is like um, your great, great grandma, right? Um, it is the last resort. There is no place after that. There is not a second conversation to be had. We have eight justices and we have a chief justice. All have life terms. Remember, there are no qualifications to be a Supreme Court justice. You just have to be appointed and then Senate approved or, or Congress approved. So our chief justice right now, you should know who our, who our justices are and you should know who our chief justice is. And you should note their political leanings because it changes by Supreme Court. And we had such a major change in the last five years that um, it's important that you're keeping up with that. Okay. All appeals, if they decide to hear your case, if the Supreme Court chooses your case to be heard, they do it through a writ of certiorari. Uh, I'm so good at forming um, You don't have to, you don't have to put that there was a writ of certiori in the in your papers because it's a Supreme Court case. So of course it was, right? That's just the formal way to say I accept. This is the I do of the Supreme Court. There's no reason to say that. If I say this is my husband, you would say you wouldn't say like, mm, did you say I do? Well, yeah, I just said that, right? It's that same idea. It's it's redundant and it's unnecessary. So just because you don't know what or don't necessarily know what it is when you're reading, please note that it is not necessary in your paper. Okay. Um, and there's the oral arguments that you can see their calendar, what cases are coming up. But I showed you that on the OMS site as well. So remember, Article 1 is going to cover what? Congress, 2, President, 3, Courts. So here we're saying, can you get kicked out um, as a Supreme Court judge or justice? And here we're saying, as long as their behavior is good. Only once has somebody actually been kicked out. Um, Samuel, I'm going to have his name. I always have it written down because I always forget his name. Samuel Chase. Samuel Chase was kicked out um, because, and it was for his political beliefs, actually. He was booted from the Supreme Court and they came back. Um, he, you know, he basically moved through HR <laughs> in essence. And they said, no, you cannot remove somebody just because you disagree with their beliefs. They would have to have truly bad behavior and that's not happening. Um, I am going to pause this because I need to go teach other class. So I hope that it holds and I will be right back.